I think they deserve another amen like the president described. It is a joy to be here at Michigan camp meeting. I will uh, go ahead and confess that I'm an old Seventh-day Adventist. My barber keeps telling me to uh, dye my gray hair, but I assure him that I've earned every one of them. I uh, am a third generation Adventist and proud of it. My mom was a church school teacher, and I know these days you call them educators, but she was a church school, t school teacher. My dad was a call, call porter. Today they call them literature evangelists. He was a call porter and proud of it. And for all of our lives, it was the day of anticipation when we went to camp meeting. Now, it has changed now. There are people who watch us on the internet, and they sit at home, and that's okay. I'm not angry with you. In fact, I welcome you today. But uh, there's something special about sitting in this room, or one of the rooms that hold overflow crowds, because, is the mic not on? Do we have technical difficulties? Hold on, folk. We'll be right back with you. I thought you could hear me. Okay, I did what you said. I turned it on. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm accustomed to this kind of stuff. <clears throat> in fact, I'm also accustomed to him turning it down in a few minutes when I get excited. Because <laughs> I promise you I will. Some of you watch me on television and you know that I do try to keep it down. I uh, say to myself every time before I preach, I'm going to make everybody happy because I know there are folks out there who say, why is he screaming like that? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you why I'm screaming. Uh, I won't tell you the whole story, but if this place caught on fire, I would not whisper to you and say, get out. <laughs> I'd scream it to you. <clears throat> I think we're at the point now where this place is about to be on fire. And I don't think it's time to whisper. What do you say? Yeah. Well, I am uh, appreciative of the invitation. Uh, I thank your president for allowing me to be here. I've been treated very kindly by all the folk that they put in place. I am very excited about the theme that you have chosen. Because I believe that if there was ever a time when we need to look away from the world, it is now you will uh, detect that I am not excited about this new flavor that I find among us. We are being influenced too much by the world, I believe. Somehow I got the impression ages ago that God sent us to put our influence on the world, not the converse. In fact, the way you ought to be able to tell who Seventh-day Adventists are is because we manage to be happy in the midst of all this confusion. Oh, it's not a silly grin. We understand what's going on. We know that these are important movements. We understand that we are close to the end of time. But when Christ is in your heart, there is a joy that the world can't steal. And I tell you today that if you don't have it, then there's something wrong with the way you got here. Because when Jesus resides in you, there's a joy that bubbles over and influences everybody around you. Well, you've heard the text, and I want to tell you that for the next few moments, I've entitled the thought that we'll share, to see his face. To see his face. Would you pray with me? Father, I come to these places where I've accepted jobs that I can't do. And here I am again. I've said to the president that I'd speak here at camp meeting, but you and I know that I've never done a successful sermon without you. In fact, any time anybody believes that I've done a good job, it was never me. It was always you. So I come humbly asking that you'd fill up what sounds like my voice with the power of your voice that you would empty what seems like my presence 
and fill it with your presence. I ask you, Father, that you would aim my words, that you would send your holy angels to lean into my ears and whisper what you want said. I promise you that I'll say whatever you want me to say. If I planned it, I'll say it. If I never planned it, I'll say it anyway, because this is your day. This is your house. We are your people, and we have come to hear the voice of God. Speak to us, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that there came a time in the experience of Moses when Moses declared, I am not in the future to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, when you read that casually, it doesn't mean anything. You think maybe he's come to some moment of, uh, of crisis and perhaps he wants to augment his identity. But the fact is that Moses was in line to become the Pharaoh of Egypt. And that in itself is a miracle. How could a little boy fished out of the Nile how could a child from another culture, how could a baby who by Pharaoh's law should have been killed, how could that child be adopted into a family of Egypt, be trained by their greatest teachers, and come to a moment when he would succeed the Pharaoh, when he would sit in a place where a little Israelite boy should never have been. It tells you that if you serve God, there is no imagination that covers what God will do for you. There are some of us in this room here today who are interested enough in our background to know that God has brought us from places that never could have led here. But God makes ways out of no way. If you know that, is there an amen in you? There are some of you who live where you shouldn't live who drive cars that you shouldn't drive, who have education that you shouldn't have. But when you trust in God, God opens the way for you. He gives you more than you could ask or imagine. And I thank God for that. Moses is now in this situation. The Bible says when he was grown, when he was mature, he had been trained in the arts and sciences that made Egypt the greatest culture that was on earth at its time. Acts chapter 7, about verse 22 and 23, you begin to read the things that they taught Moses. And he was an apt student. He learned everything well. He must have mastered the language and even learned how to pronounce words as though he had lived there all of his life. But everything the teacher brought to him, he picked it up so quickly that he was one of those folk who was in class whose hands stayed up. You know the ones I'm talking about. Get on your nerves, don't they? You haven't conquered the lesson. You don't know what the teacher's talking about. And here's somebody who every time the teacher says, what do you think about that? Their hand is up. I've been in class with folk who we wanted to put an arm on, just stick it on the side of them. So it stood there because they were always volunteering. They get on your nerves, but you kind of envy them because they pick up everything so quickly. Moses was a student like that. He learned how to build the pyramids, didn't build them, no reason to believe he did, but he understood how they were built. He probably didn't participate in ritual embalming, but he understood it. He knew all of those things about the gods of Egypt, didn't believe in them, but understood why others did. In fact, his favorite place was in the class that taught about military strategy. Moses had so many talents given to him by God. Haven't you discovered that God will lift your IQ? There's somebody in here who's been in a class, and when the class started, you didn't even understand what it was about. You opened the book and thought it was written in another language. But after you had been on your knees, God opened up your understanding, and the light came on. And all of a sudden, you found yourself advancing in something that you thought was impossible. 
God gives that kind of precocious nature. He had given it to Moses. And so when Moses was in class, particularly to learn about military strategy, he understood that he had some kind of insight that only God could give. There's every reason to believe that Moses had led the armies of Egypt by the time he says the thing that we read in the, in the Hebrews chapter. There's every reason to believe that he had conquered enemies for Egypt. There's every reason to believe that those who were in power recognized he may not be Egyptian by culture, but he is so talented that we are blessed to have him here. In fact, those little books that we call the spirit of prophecy declare that Moses became the pride of the nation. Can you imagine that? How can you come up through the ranks? Somebody must have been angry. In fact, I read much of the literature that suggests that when the scholars identify the, the daughter of Pharaoh, they say, if it's Hatshepsut, so I'll say, if it's Hatshepsut. But if that's the woman who was his sponsor, who took him as her child, then there's every reason to believe that this woman pulled him into the greatest teachers that Egypt had, that Moses excelled in everything. In fact, let me read to you what Ellen White says about him in Conflict and Courage 81 of great personal attractions, noble in form and stature, of cultivated mind and princely bearing, and renowned as a military leader, he became the nation's pride. I would suggest to you, and let's make it real, that's what I like to do. If Moses walked in the back of this auditorium today, if he tried to make his way to the front without being noticed, I suggest to you that every woman who is not married would pay strict attention. I say it kindly, but perhaps some who are married <laughs> might take a look. Make sure your husband isn't watching when you do it. But. In fact, let me go further to say every man in the audience would take notice because of his muscular build and his princely bearing. He didn't walk like just anybody. When you looked at him, you knew that he was a cut above. And when the people of Egypt saw him, they forgot his Hebrew background. They were excited about the specter of his becoming their Pharaoh. And when he was at the very top of his game, when little boys walked around trying to be like Moses, and you know how little boys do. You know you've made it when the little kids start imitating you. When they start trying to walk like you and when they start trying to imitate your posture. When the little guys saw Moses, they said, hey, look, don't say anything, but there's Moses. There, there's reason to believe that he looked in every way like an Egyptian. I, I've seen all of those movies like you have and think that perhaps he had something that started at his waist so that you could see his muscular build from his waist up, probably had his hair cut in that circle that didn't cover his whole head, pulled down to the side and pinned with silver or gold, probably had his face adorned in some way that wouldn't please everyone if he walked in here today. But while he was completely Egyptian in his outward appearance, I am proud to tell you According to what the writer to the remnant church says, he was inside completely God's child. He never gave in. He never became who they were. And that, my friends, takes a great deal. In fact, when he comes to the moment where they are about to make him Pharaoh, there is something more that he has to do. He cannot just accomplish great things in wisdom. He can't just be educated as an Egyptian. He must become part of the priestly caste. So now he's got to switch religions in order to be Pharaoh. 
And that's where he made his decision. That's it. I'll go so far, but I will never give up my God. I know who I am. I am not the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He understood that when he made that declaration, it would be the end to all of his advancement. He understood that he could not be Pharaoh after he had denied his sponsor. In fact, as you look into history, as I have done, you will discover that Hatshepsut's regency is, is no longer in the history books. She loses her power because she has brought this Moses as far as he can go. But in a strange moment when he has to make a choice between Jehovah and the thousands of gods of Egypt, he decides, I don't see anything even in Egypt that's powerful enough to sway me from my God. So take the world. Take all that's in the palace. Moses could any day of his life had said, I want to go down the Nile. I want to go on the barge. There would be hundreds of people who would move quickly. They'd get him there and there would be a, 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 a retinue of, of slaves, if not those who were trained to give him every whim of his desire. But when Moses looked at all that the world had to offer, and it was the best that the world had to offer. And when he compared that with serving with the slave nation who had become his people, he decided it's better to be with God's people as a slave than to be with those people and turn my back on my God. He decided in the words of one, one scholar that the worst day with God is better than the best day turning my back on him. I don't know about you, but I've got a feeling that we had all better make that decision. In fact, uh, let me just for a moment pull Moses out of his time. I, I love it when politicians say things that the spin doctors don't think ought to have been said. You've seen those wonderful things. It, it happens fairly often these days. A politician will stand up and say something, and you see them taking notes furiously. And, uh, and as soon as the politician moves, somebody will come up and say uh, what, uh, what he meant was. Some of you may have gotten the impression, but actually uh, he, he's been having a little problem with the flu and he took some uh, cold medication that uh, has him thinking a little differently. We hope you'll forgive him. Here is what he actually meant to say. Spin doctors. Can you imagine what the spin doctors would have done when Moses stood up in some public place and said, while I love the woman who nourished me and who educated me, while I appreciate what she's done for me, while it's a great thing for you to look at me and think that I might be your Pharaoh, I've got to tell you today that I cannot go any further in fact, I announce to you now that I am not the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I am a child of Jehovah, the one God of Israel. And the spin doctors must have, uh, folk, forgive, forgive him. Uh, he hasn't been feeling well. In fact, we begged him not to make that speech today, but he just insisted. So could we tell you what he means? What he's saying is that he also loves his own people. He loves us. And he loves them. And he was simply trying to make that dramatic today. So we hope you'll forgive the words that came from his mouth. He certainly will be our Pharaoh. Can we all just join in a round of applause? And they would run after that. But the fact is, there was no doubt in Moses' mind. Moses knew who he was. Now, before I get to the place where I want to land, I've got to say it's important for us to know who we are. Enough already with this group of believers who can't figure out where we fit anymore. I think there is too much fascination with political parties among us. I'm not against them. I don't think there's a dime's worth of difference between them. Hmm? 
If you get them in a room all by themselves and there are no cameras or radio channels, you'll discover that they all get along quite well. I've been there. I know that a lot of this must be planned by some greater mind to get us distracted from what we really ought to be doing. We ought to be remembering who we are and we ought to be standing for our God. But instead, there are some of us who are sitting here today wondering who among us is in that party, who's in that party. Folks, we're not big enough yet to split by parties. Huh? Well, while I'm there, and I, I suppose you expect this, we're not big enough to split by what we look like. We are God's children. I don't know about you, but I didn't paint myself. I was born this way. I was shocked to discover that everybody didn't look like me. <laughs> I thought we were all together. I thought we were all one. And then I started hearing little funny remarks. I was born in Alabama. Everybody knows that's South America. <laughs> and I was shocked to discover that there were distinctions that were made. And I think those distinctions may be fine out there, but when it comes to God's people, we ought to recognize that whatever we came here looking like, if Jesus dwells in our hearts, if we are part of God's remnant church, we don't have the right to make differences between us. Amen. And I don't say that to any particular group. Everybody has the right to discriminate, but you can't do it in the name of Jesus. So I suggest to you that it's time for us to do like Moses. We have never been offered what Moses was offered. I don't believe there's anybody in here today who is in danger of being drafted for the presidency of the United States. But Moses was about to be the leader of the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And he knew so well who he was that he said, I'm not going to take it because I've got to be faithful to my God. And I believe that we ought to be a people willing to say who we are unequivocally. In fact, we ought to say it everywhere, not just in the places where it's comfortable. You know, when you get here, it's popular. So everybody can mouth these shibboleths. Yes, I love being an Adventist. Don't you love the, the Sabbath school lessons? And you know you haven't even cracked that book. You haven't seen what's inside. But it's something popular to say. You're saying, isn't it wonderful when we come together like this? You can't even remember how to sing the songs. You have to look very hard at these, at these wonderful video monitors to know when to put words into verse 2. You know verse 1 and the last verse. We all know those. But you haven't been around long enough to know verse 2 and 3. But we've got to get to the place where we're not, we're not ashamed to say who we are, even if it means that we lose something temporarily. <clears throat> I believe that we are in a time now when powers are realigning in a suspicious way. God allowed it to be that I was in Warsaw, Poland, when a strange thing was going on. I was just doing what God tells me to do. I love to preach the truth as it is in Jesus. I've said it in public. I would preach it in a phone booth. There are no phone booths left, barely. Everybody has a cell phone now. But what I'm trying to say is I'll preach it anywhere. They sent me to Warsaw. There were only two people in Warsaw who looked like me and only one could speak English. <laughs> but I was happy to be there because through my interpreter, I was preaching what I know to be true from the word of God. And there's nothing that makes me happier. In fact, as I walked around Warsaw, I began to see the signs that advertised my coming. I discovered that my throat was cut on my posters. You don't have to speak Polish to understand that. <laughs> and when I asked my interpreter, what does it mean? He wouldn't tell me. I finally saw in the... the, the uh, the library, a, a newspaper with my name in it. I can read my name, even in Polish. And when I told him to translate it for me, I discovered that they had written an article that said, this black evangelist will be killed like so many others. And you know what I said to myself? Lord, just let me live long enough to finish. Because I thank you for the privilege of preaching your word no matter where I am. 
While I was there, I had no idea that the President of the United States was cooperating with the Bishop of Rome to destabilize the Eastern Bloc. I had no idea on a certain night while I was preaching, the election had taken place that day. I didn't know that the Russian army was poised at the border, ready for something strange to happen. I had no idea why my audience would not say a word. And let me pause to tell you that anybody who listens to me for a long time will eventually say amen. In fact, the people in Poland did not have that as a habit, but eventually they began to ask, is there something we can say? And one night I taught them how to say amen. I said, if it's true, you say amen. If it's false, you stay quiet. <laughs> and when I taught them how to say amen, I discovered that they said, Amen. I said, no, you got to get out of the way because when I say one thing, I'm coming real fast with another. So say amen and get out of my way. <laughs> you would have been surprised. A Polish congregation saying amen like a black congregation in Southern America. <laughs> but on that night, they were deathly quiet. And what I did not know was that under the name of religious ecumenism, Statecraft was being practiced, and I believe that in the beginning of this whole situation, we began to see the unfolding of prophecy, prophecy being fulfilled when our nation cooperated with a religious entity to cause something to happen in world affairs. And I want to remind you, I can never forget, I want to remind you that these new alliances are going to fulfill the prophecies that we have read about all of our lives. We are looking at the fulfillment of prophecy right now. How dare we act as though this is business as usual? It is not. When the funeral occurred at the Vatican, history was broken because there was more participation from the United States than ever before. It was unprecedented. And if you sit here and watch this and can't figure it out, then you've got to go back and find some book that they gave to, to, to grade school children and start at, at 101, because we are looking at history turning into prophecy. When you look at what's happening in Iraq and when you hear them talking about the Tigris River, hey folks, no matter how light your study has been in prophecy, it ought to make your antenna go all the way up. We are watching something that we have talked about for ages. It's happening now. And I believe that we ought to know who we are in these times. We don't have time to align ourselves too deeply with any political party. And I know that you say, well, there's one that's more righteous than the other. Look closely. Look closely. While some believe in lifestyles that we can never condone and don't seem to respect human life, you will watch others who are now trying to legislate Christianity rather than sharing the truth about Jesus. Somehow it seems that I remember that we found America because church and state had be began to act as one. We came here to get the freedom to worship according to our own consciences. Woe be unto us if we've now come to a place where we join with groups who want to legislate how you must worship. And I'm telling you, you, uh, you forget who you are and you'll find yourself in strange places with strange bedfellows. The fact is that even in this war, and folk, I, I don't know anything about war. I don't claim to. They would never call me into the war room at the Pentagon. I don't understand the ins and outs of that. But I do know that there are some things that Christians can never participate in. No matter what the threat. Because you can't allow terrorists to change who you are. Well, you were quiet, but that's okay. I got to remember where I am. I don't care if they bring a thousand terrorists. I've got to still stand for Jesus. 
The wonderful thing about standing for Jesus is that even if you are destroyed by terrorists, the Bible says if you die in Christ, you'll rise again. So I don't seek a quick death. I am not trying to leave this earth before my time. But I do know that death cannot have the effect on me that it has on others because Jesus holds the power of death in his hands. He's got the keys of death and of hell. So if I live for him, I can trust him to take care of that. This death that we see every day is not the one we should be fearful of. It is the one that is the punishment for sin that we should worry about. And I tell you that we have come to the place now where we play too much in games that don't matter. We've got to do like Moses. And even in the midst of a crisis, remember who we are. Moses says, I tell you what, I decline. Pardon me, cover the mic. No, you don't need to cover the mic. I'm not going to be the Pharaoh. I know you wanted me to be that, but I've got to be true to my God. In fact, Moses goes now to the land of Goshen. And in that text that's written there, he says more than once, he uses the word, my brethren. I've got to go and see my brethren. You know something? We ought to remember who the brethren are. And let me pause. I know you're going to be angry with me at this, but if we call each other brother and sister, shouldn't there be some cohesiveness amongst us? If you talk about my brother, now I have only one sibling, one brother, and there are things that I say to him to try and correct his behavior that he does not like. But if you were to overhear me talk to him and come and say the same thing to him, we would both get together and push you out of the room. I've got the right to tell him because he's my brother. You don't have the right to tell him because you're not. Friends of mine in this church, we are brothers and sisters. We cannot take pride in having other people talk about the family. In fact, we ought to have too much else to talk about than to join with someone else talking about the faults in the family. I am not pleased with the faults in me. I am not pleased with the faults in you. And I will come to you if God dictates it, but I will not allow anybody else to drag your name through the mud. You are my family. Amen. You may not even like me, but I'm your brother. <laughs> God has made it so. And so we must now look at this situation where a man who was about to be Pharaoh says, I know who I am. Now the text says it fairly clear, but Ellen White makes it even clearer. When you get to the end of this text, you discover that God says about Moses, Moses did not fear the king who was the Pharaoh because he had seen the invisible king. When you have seen the one with ultimate power, then someone with a little power doesn't frighten you. Moses, even when he made his glaring error, you remember, evidently he had been quite good in hand-to-hand -hand combat. When you read the text that says he slew the Egyptian taskmaster, it is not a long soliloquy. Evidently, it happened quickly. Moses must have mastered the art so that he could just go over and say, uh, let me see if anybody else is looking. <laughs> and then buried him in the sand. It was not a long struggle. He must have known exactly what to do and when to do it. And it happened quickly. That was his one glaring error in Egypt. But after that it happened, and after he left Egypt, I, forgive me, but it's one of those times that I, I just enjoy rehearsing. Moses goes now to Jethro's territory, and I'm sure he came with a memory of his resume. Didn't have time to get it put on leather or parchment. He left in quite a hurry. But when uh, Jethro says, do you need a job? He says, yes. What can you do? Well, I am well versed in many things, but my particular passion is to fight wars. I am good at it. 
Jethro says, well, we don't have many wars between the sheep and the goats. <laughs> but you could mind the sheep. Ellen White says that God had to take Moses out of the glaring controversies that surrounded him so that he could unlearn the things that he should not have learned in Egypt. And as he watched those tender little lambs, he would see them born, one of them born perhaps with a twisted limb, but he learned to love them so much that he would pick up the little lamb and turn its little leg and turn it a little bit more until finally one day he could make it straight. He knew them by name. They knew him by name. He would speak and they knew his voice. And Moses came to understand the relationship between God and his children. Then Ellen White says he began to look at those mountains that seemed to last forever and God's name was written on the mountains. He looked at the clouds above that moved silently and God's name was written on the clouds. He looked at every blade of grass and God's name was written there too. And finally, you remember that he came to a time when God brought a graduation situation, set a tree on fire. And when Moses came, he spoke from the fire and said, take your shoes off your feet. This land, this ground is holy. Moses accepted a job. It was a life that was divided in 40-year sequences, 12 and 28, the first part, until he left Egypt. Then another 40 when he was in the wilderness keeping sheep. Then another 40 when he led the children of Israel. But when he came to that point, he recognized that the only way that he could make it in that situation was to have an awareness of God at all times. Now, this is going to be a challenge to somebody. But the fact is, and let me read it from Conflict and Courage, page 84. He looked to the things unseen and faltered not. The recompense of reward was attractive to him, and it may be also to us. He was familiar with God. I want to say to you before I shut my mouth today, that you do not have to see God's face on a television screen. You do not have to see God's face in a book. Moses had none of these things. But let me read what it says on page 83 of Conflict and Courage. Moses did not merely think of God, he saw him. God was the constant vision before him. He never lost sight of his face. Now here is the conclusion of this matter. I believe that we have come to a place where we are not certain about who we are because we don't see the face of Jesus enough. You can read the Bible, but you don't automatically see the face of Jesus. You've got to get beyond the words. They can't just be ink stains on paper. But if Moses in Egypt could see the face of God, if Moses, in fact, let me read further, he saw Jesus as his Savior and believed that the Savior's merits would be imputed to him. This faith was no guesswork to Moses. It was reality. This is the kind of faith we need, faith that will endure the test. We have got to come to the place where we can see the face of Jesus every day of our lives. You can. The face is available. The challenge is that we are allowing too many other things to fill our vision. When I was a little boy, I did not like to sleep in a dark room. I only had one brother. I've told you that. Neither did he. Our parents had to have some kind of light inside or else we'd scheme and dream until we made up monsters. So my father got creative. Not only did he want to have a light in the room, but he went and got a light with a beautiful, beautiful picture. And inside the picture, there was something that turned 
and showed you Jesus' face moving by the lampshade. So at night, instead of just looking at any old light, my father intended that we should come to know the face of Jesus. Oh, don't bug me with who painted it and what he looked like. It's relatively unimportant. What dad wanted us to do was to see Jesus, and here's how good it got. We discovered that if you look long enough at an image that's lighted, you can look at a dark wall and you'll still see the image on the wall. In fact, anything else you look at will have the face that has been in the light superimposed over it and it will change all else that you see. Here is my word to you today. If you're going to stand like Moses in crises, you've got to look at his face long enough, shining from the word. So matter, no matter what trial you may have, when you look at that trial, you'll see the face of Jesus superimposed over whatever it is, and it will take away your fear. May God bless you. This media was provided by Hope Media Ministry. For this and other great witnessing material, please visit our website at www.hopevideo.org or you can call us at 616-676-3705. You can also write us at P.O. Box 752, ADA, that's A-D-A, -A, Michigan. 49301. Our media includes DVD, video, CD audio, and cassette. You can also listen to much of our media at our online media center for free at www.hopevideo.org.